Okay, I guess my mic is on. Um, well, welcome everyone to this afternoon's session on the Archaeological Survey of India. Um, I'm going to just briefly introduce the speakers. I'm Malini Roy. I'm the head of visual arts at the British Library. I focus on South Asian art and photography. And I've been here for about 10 years. And my most recent, well, last major thing was I did an exhibition on the Mughal Empire, art, culture, and empire. And that was back in 2012, 2013, and working on various projects since. But I'd like to introduce John Faulkner, who was the head of visual arts until he retired last year. Um, he's a well-known art historian and photo historian specializing on 19th century photographs. He's worked extensively on South Asia, East Asia, and everywhere else. <laughs> um, he's curated um, several photographic exhibitions in India, Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, and China. And most importantly, he has worked extensively on the history of the Archaeological Survey of India. <coughs> Next, we've got George Michel, who's a long-standing academic and archaeologist and architect by training. And um, he's been working extensively in India on the ground in Hampi and the surrounding regions, as well as the Deccan. And George has written extensively on the subject. I think you've published more than Last, I saw something counted about 50 books on the topic. <laughs> I could be wrong, but that's what I picked up when I did a quick search. Um, but George's research is quite important because it's really documented the historical site over 30 years. And we're very fortunate that George has actually donated his archives, including his maps, plans, photographs, and drawings documenting the region to the library. So. I hope that was okay to mention. Yes. I haven't started well cataloging them or researching them, but they're there. And lastly, of course, everyone knows Will. Um, he's the travel writer, co-organizer of the festival, and as well as a photographer at the moment. <laughs> and I hope we'll have an exciting discussion about the Archaeological Survey of India. So many of you may have been listening to or reading about current politics in India and hearing about the plans with the government to privatize some of the various sites. But to begin with, I really thought it was more important for everyone to get an understanding of about what is the Archaeological Survey of India and its historic roots when it was set up in the mid-19th century. For that, I thought John might be able to give us a, a quick potted history of the ASI. Uh, yeah, a, a very quick potted history. Um, if you have had cause to look at the volume, a 150-year anniversary volume of the Archaeological Survey, which was published by the survey a few years ago. Um, the narrative of archaeological researches in India follows a seamless upward trend of investigation, cooperation, increasing knowledge from those early days in the 18th century when antiquarians like Sir William Jones laid the, found, laid the foundations for such investigations. Um, I was a little surprised that the ASI didn't take the opportunity in this volume to present a slightly more nuanced and actually more interesting story or history of the survey. Um, which, of course, does have its roots in the 18th century investigations. Um, but it's actually a story that has much more to do with politics, personal ambition, aggravations, um, quite often bad archaeology, um, until it developed into an organization that we know today. Um, even in the late 18th century, a... Danish traveler, Carsten Niebuhr, who spent some time in Bombay in the 1780s, castigated the British as being entirely concerned with making money and taking no opportunity to investigate important sites on their doorstep, like the island of Elephanta, which is just off the coast of Mumbai, as you know. Um, and it's only in the early years of the 19th century that the British authorities in India started to acknowledge some sort of responsibility for protecting the monuments of India. In 1808, for instance, a commission was set up by Lord Minto to 
protect the Taj Mahal. And this was done, I think, less out of interest in the architecture of the Taj Mahal or the architecture of India generally, but more as a reputational move against accusations of Philistinism on the part of the English. Um, in the course of the 19th century, great effort was put in by individual scholars to start these investigations, and this led in the 1860s to a short, um, seemingly temporary um, establishment of an archaeological survey, followed in 1871 by the final establishment of the survey. Um, and since then, it has um, continued its work for a century and a half, um, sometimes to acclaim, sometimes to considerable criticism. Um, I think the story in the 19th century is characterized largely by personal antagonisms between many of the scholars like Alexander Cunningham, who had a long-lasting feud with his successor, James Burgess. Um, so in the midst of great archaeological dedication, there are a lot of personal issues being resolved. Um, and this, of course, all took place within a context, a political context, of looking at questions such as, should archaeological objects remain in sight? Should they be removed to central museums? Should they come to the United Kingdom? Um, the great stupa at Bahut is now sort of set in concrete in the Indian Museum in Calcutta, never to be removed. And it may be new to some people that the, one of the great gateways at Sanchi very narrowly missed being transported to England. Only the outbreak of the um, uprising of 1856 prevented it coming to England. So there are all those sorts of issues which are bound up within the work of the survey. Um, and I think, for the moment, I'm going to stop there and... Um, I think it might me. just be a bit worthwhile explaining to them what kind of data they were collecting. Um, I mean, at the British Library, we have about 40,000 photographs and drawings relating to the ASI collections. Would you be able to give us a few words about... Uh, what it was that they were documented from the mid 19th century, because we've got the earliest photographs here of some of the sites, but maybe just along those lines. Well, certainly, in the in the early 1850s, the Bombay government was paying artists to um, make painted copies of the cave temples of Western India. In 1853, the Court of Directors in London, um, primarily because it was seemingly a cheaper idea, suggested the use of photography. And from that time on, photography was the principal means of documentation of Indian architecture and archaeology. Um, the collections that have survived and are now held both in the British Library and in the Archaeological Survey in Delhi are a unique and very valuable resource. But um, in some areas, they illustrate how haphazard the, the um, documentation project was, there are vast gaps in what is recorded. There's very little actual archaeological photography as such, records of excavation works of in a, carried out in a professional way. There are a few photographs of the work being done at Bahut when that was being dug up by Beglar and was photographed. But a lot of the uh, photographs would horrify archaeologists today in terms of the lack of detailed documentation of fine spots and excavation data. Um, having said that, uh, they do remain a unique resource of Indian monuments and those were, and the fact that the choice of monuments in itself is um, a reflection of what archaeologists at that period considered were most important to record and document. Um, so while it's a patchy record of material, partly because the Indian government, as ever, and no doubt to this day, um, was mean with money and never devoted the resources required to have a full and comprehensive documentation of Indian architecture. So what we have in terms of photographic records is extremely valuable. It does make one think how much more valuable it would have been if the whole project had been um, continued in a comprehensive, organized way without repetition, 
<laughs> sorry, deviation and hesitation. Sorry, I was listening to Radio 4 this morning. Uh, but actually, that possibly sums it up in some ways. I think maybe George might be able to give some more insight. Um, you've, been spend, you've spent more than 30 years working in India. And could you tell us a bit about working on excavations and a little bit about your time in Hampi and your connections with the ASI? Well, um, a little bit of biography. I'm a failed architect. <laughs> um, so that gave me the opportunity of redirecting my uh, meager abilities to documenting architecture in India. And the ASI, as John was telling us, have done a fantastic job, but it's not consistent. There were lots of gaps. Uh, my um, ability was to somehow identify what they hadn't done. And so as a foreigner working in India, I was able to liaise with the ASI to say, could I make measured architectural drawings of buildings that had not been measured by them? And this was permissible. I would never have been given a clearance as a foreigner to excavate. That would have been very difficult. But to measure, to map, to photograph, not to touch anything, not to conserve, that was fine. And as some of you may know, I started as a student here in London, going out to the Badami area, Chalukya, temples of the 7th and 8th centuries. Nobody in London ever heard of these, but that doesn't matter. I went out there, did the drawings, etc., etc. And then, at the beginning of the 80s, after several visits to Hampi Vijinagra, which many of you may have gone there, I realized there was no map of the site, no list of monuments. The ASI had somehow not treated this site with the sort of detail. And one of the um, explanations was that it was too late. Why do you want to waste your time on the 15th and 16th centuries? What about the earlier stuff? I said, but it's very interesting, you know. It's an important place. So, with John Fritz, who is here, and also Carlos Sinopoli, who's come from the US, we were part of a team that for more than 20 years, in grass huts and uh, in tents that some of you have visited here today, we did a 22-year sort of mapping project, thanks to the energies, talents, and willingness of an international team of architecture and archaeology students from different institutions in India, <coughs> and also from the US, from the UK, Australia, everywhere. And the ASI permitted that, and we liaised with them. They also were excavating at the time and revealing these structures which were underneath the dirt. And um, luckily for us, they had nobody to make architectural drawings of these, whatever the structures they were. And they said, do you think maybe some of your students could do some drawings? This was the informal relationship we had with the ASI, and so we worked with them very comfortably. After all, we're in the middle of damn nowhere, in the middle of this site, and with the state archaeology. So I would say that um, our relationship with the ASI was not only necessary, essential, but productive and creative. Well, we're talking about the ASI drawings, uh, I'm sorry, the ASI in general. Before the ASI was formed, kind of historic archives were available um, that anyone would go back to with pre-ASI? What kind of sources are available to document the building of temples, various architectural sites, um, such as the Taj Mahal? I mean, is there a lot of written sources that are available? Well, there were, there were travelers, of course. And there were the professional artists, whether they were Daniels, uncle nephew team, mm -hmm. the first but photographers. But I mean, more uh, local artists. I mean, we know a lot about the Western artists who are traveling and the Western artists later on who work for the ASI. But I'm talking about, are there, I mean, for, would there have been a systematic recording of temple diagrams um, commissioned by the kings so, so. or no? You know about the Delhi materials. But for Hampi, we have company school drew paintings. Yes. Quite a lot of company school paintings. Yeah. Yes, there were local and artists were and late, commissioned and late mogul um, aerial plans of various right. sites. And, yeah. So there was, I would say, sporadic interest. Mm -hmm. Some of it very sincere, some of it very amateurish, because there were no professional archaeological photographers in those mm -hmm. days. And uh, you know about these great 
1865, right. wax paper negatives of 1865 that were found, 1856, what I'm saying. And, and then, of course, there's the, the Oriental Societies of Bengal and, and, and Jones right. and Princep and these kind of characters based out of Park Street with quite a lot of funding, yeah. um, making um, uh, amateurish and, and, and fragmentary but important contributions of recording the Ashoka Pillars and, uh, and getting down inscriptions and working out the, the, the lay of the land and, and, and Cunningham starting off with them before going off on his own. Uh, I mean, within the Mughal period, I mean, you don't have the systematic um, recording of buildings, maps, diagrams of various sites. Um, and that's something that's a bit of a failing um, for art historians, that we don't have something to go back to. But I was just curious with temple architecture if there were written sources that one could refer to, but I guess not. not. much. I mean, epigraphy was the big thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If there was anything written on a monument, somebody would sure to go along and try to read it. And it's this prejudice that if it was written, it had more uh, validity than it was built. So when I did my PhD at SOAS, they said, how can you study these buildings if you can't read what's written on them, or if there's nothing written on them, as if the building had no evidence in itself? And that's how I think there was a lot of... Um, well, that, that is, that know, is emphasized by the fact that the first photographs um, taken by Biggs, who suggested it to the East India Company, what he was suggesting photography should be used for was to copy inscriptions, not to actually, actually record building. buildings. Like that Tanjore um, one, that's fantastic. Yeah. And you get these uh, epigraphic surveys in the, in yes. the late 19th century, multi-multi-volume text with all the Chola, um, the Chola temples often have yes, hundreds of feet of inscriptions with so names there, and dedications. So there's a vast and, amount of um, photographs of inscriptions in the mm -hmm. office collections, which actually by the end of the 19th century, Burgess said, in fact, they're entirely useless. We spent so much money on these <laughs> and they were largely. No, but it's fantastic work. There's no doubt about it. Yes. And the histories of India, Correct. which are largely, to a large extent, based on the material that was gathered from this. Hmm. And the ASI was one of the sponsors eventually of right. this enterprise. I kind of want to change the direction slightly um, and ask Will. You write extensively on Delhi um, during, throughout your career, and various publications look at different buildings, such as the um, in Hyderabad, the residency in Hyderabad. Oh. And I'm just wondering, with in having lived in India for the last several two decades, three, <laughs> three <laughs> um, is there a particular site that you've grown to love and watched it either decay or? Be well maintained. I mean, how yes, do I mean, you feel watching such a transformation of the local topography over a course of thirty years? And I mean, do you document this in your writing at all? The Delhi is a particularly um, fraught place for ancient monuments. In in this country, you, in a sense, you've got three waves of conservation. You've got, on one hand, English heritage to look after archaeological sites. On the second hand, you've got uh, national trust which takes on large uh, private buildings which are given by families. And then you have a whole listing uh, service. So every building in the country is either grade one, grade two, grade three. Uh, and with grade one, you can't touch anything. With grade two, you can, you can touch the interior. Uh, with grade three, you need permission to some things, and so on. So with India, you've got the ASI, which plays more or less the same role as English heritage. It looks after archaeological sites, uh, and with a, with a very limited budget, considering the extraordinary riches that, that, that are out there. Uh, it has somehow to do the jobs of investigation, of archaeology, conservation, preservation, uh, study, and guarding and security, and, and in a sense, management of tourism. So it's got a, many very different things. And you know, the conservation labs is a quite different job to actually sort of guarding the sites. Uh, and at the moment, there is absolutely no system of listing. So if you own an 18th century Havelli in the middle of Old Delhi, and you decide you want to build a supermarket on it, you can. Not a single piece of legislation exists to stop you knocking the whole bloody thing down and pouring concrete over the whole thing and destroying everything there. Literally, there's nothing out there legally that anyone can do to stop you. And that is, in a sense, the, the, the kind of most vulnerable place for, for, uh, for uh, destruction of heritage. Um, because uh, I have seen in the last 30 years the old city of Delhi, which I'd say maybe 80% of the Havelis, which I used to go wandering around in the late 80s, are no longer there. They're now concrete. They're dead. They're gone. There's nothing we can do about it. There's odd arches, the occasional gateway. Uh, but also, uh, the kind of material the archaeological survey should be looking at. 
and which is under their remit, which means medieval monuments, uh, tombs, mosques. And we can document how bad that's become in Delhi because in the early 1960s, there was a massive and very systematic Japanese survey uh, uh, of every single sultanate building. Now, no one in India reads Japanese, uh, but it is the only, and it's never been translated, but you can go into the, to the, to a couple of libraries. There's, there's, a, there's a whole set in the uh, uh, International Center. There's another set in the Indira Gandhi Center of Performing Arts. There's another one in the National Museum. Uh, and these multi-volume Japanese things allow you to see what existed before Defense Colony, before South Extension, before all these South Delhi colonies mm -hmm. flooded over them. And, and in most cases, the big monuments, the mosques and the larger tombs have survived. But all the little things, the pillars, the tombs, the mon minarets, lone claps, are all just gone. Maybe 65% at the late, last estimate of, of what was recorded at the late 1950s and early 1960s of the, of the monuments which the ASI is specifically there to look after, medieval monuments, have gone completely. Um, and then there's just this gradual encroachment of buildings that are under their watch. So to answer your question specifically, the Zafar Mahal is the monument particularly close to my heart. It's the summer palace of the last emperor, Bahadur Shah Zafar, uh, built initially by Shah Alam and Akbar Shah, and then um, this wonderful final trumpet call of, of this fanfare of, uh, uh, of uh, late Mughal architecture when Zafar builds his great gateway, mm -hmm. an elephant gateway. And he, just before his whole dynasty is extinguished, he goes back to the style of Shah Jahan. He builds in the old Shah Jahan style. There's not a hint of his father and grandfather built in slightly classicized styles. There's a little looking at, at Luck, uh, Lucknow or Jaipur, these experiments with classicism. But uh, Zafar goes back to the original Shah Jahani style as far as he can. He builds this pure Mughal building. And when I first went there, there were four court courtyards, successive courtyards backwards. And by the time I moved back in 2004, there was just two courtyards left. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have seen in the last 10 years since the last Mughal came out, a lot of it, which is set, takes place in that building. Um, I've seen, uh, well, first of all, massive theft of Jali screens. Uh, of marble uh, fitments, of uh, the jarokas on the front. Uh, one of the inscriptions by Zafar, a, a little uh, Urdu uh, couplet on the front. Uh, and then within the last year, um, the ASI have allowed a massive new block of flats to come up on one side, immediately abutting. So it looks that, so you, you know, someone's washing line and, 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 and balcony actually abuts the back terrace of the, of the Nakarkana. Mm. Um, and nothing has been done. Absolutely nothing. But someone's taken a bribe, or just they can't, haven't got the resources to fight a case in court, um, and it's been allowed to happen. And this is a very, very important one. It's the last great Mughal monument. It's, you know, the story begins with, I suppose, with Arambagh, with Babur's first garden in Agra. It ends with Zafar Mahal, uh, with, you know, the Taj is the peak in the middle. Uh, and nothing's happened. So at every level, there's the, I mean, most, most critically, I think, in the vernacular, totally unprotected vernacular architecture, but even in these monuments at the ASI, uh, I would say since 1950, 65% of the ASI protected monuments in Delhi have gone. Is that, are you saying there's no legislation to prevent that or the legislation is ignored? Two different things. So with vernacular architecture, there's no legislation. So if I own a Haveli in Turkman Gate, I can knock it down. There's not, there's not a single piece of legislation that exists to stop a private individual selling destroying, rebuilding, coating in concrete, or anything. Uh, I think. That's not the case with archaeological survey protected monuments. They are meant to preserve those. That's their legal duty. That's their job. That's why they're there. Uh, so that loss of the 65% of sultanate buildings which have disappeared under the South Delhi colonies is all stuff that they should have actioned, that they are there to protect, which they, uh, it's their job to look after, and which they failed to do simply for lack of resources. And, and what about historic buildings which are not under the control of the ASI, for instance, a mosque, which is run by a committee. Is there so any... That's, again, the third case. I think, again, that's regarded essentially as a private building. So if you own a, if you are a waqf in charge of a, of a Tukluk mosque, and you decide to, as has happened, for example, at the Maruli Dagga this year, you decide to put, destroy a mogul um, gateway and put up brand new guard, uh, bathroom tiles from Korea uh, and coat the whole of it, you can do that. And again, you know, it's very hard to persuade people that they're not improving it. You know, tell them, they say, well, look, gorgeous, new, shiny, <laughs> lovely, <laughs> new. And so. 
leading on from this, I, I mean, at the moment, there's been quite a bit of discussion about and how would I put it, net criticism of the government to um, parcel out the Red Fort at the moment to a commercial enterprise to take over and to, um, and, and what has been the reception within India? I mean, we're reading it from abroad. I mean, has there been any action by the ASI? Are they involved or? So I think uh, the Matt side? Reed is at the back here. The, the Aga Khan Foundation, I think, was the first non governmental organization to take on a major Indian monument when they took on Humayun's tomb. Mm. And then that whole network of projects they've done since in the Zamuddin, Sunda Nursery, and so on. And so what you had there was a, an organization with a very spectacularly proven track record of, of state-of-the-art conservation, a lot of funding, uh, internationally regarded experts coming in and working with the ASI. Uh, and hand-in-hand hand with the ASI in collaboration with them. Some, not always easily. I mean, it, sometimes there, were, there was friction, but basically successfully overseeing a state-of-the-art conservation uh, project over a large chunk of, uh, first of all, Humayun's tomb, then Sunda Nursery, which itself is how many acres? 50 acres of, uh, <laughs> full of monuments. Uh, and then the whole Nizamuddin area, dredging the tank, uh, rebuilding it, so, that, you know, so no one has anything but admiration for that sort of work, where you have internationally proven expertise brought in mm -hmm. to assist an organization that simply doesn't have resources to look or conserve, um, in, in the current state of things, the monuments it, it, it's given to look after. But what the latest round has been, which is potentially a good thing, but is going to need extremely close supervision, is what they've called uh, ad allowing corporate houses to adopt uh, individual monuments. And, and the first up was the Dalmia group, whose patriarch is a member of the, uh, the Vishwa Hindu Parishad, who was one of the named accused in the destruction of the Barbary Masjid, bidding to get possession of the Red Fort, the ultimate symbol of, of Mughal uh, rule, uh, and it, presumably the kind of final target of the VHP's ire. They have now been given the the, uh, the right to, and, and, and the thing of adopting for however many, 20 crores, quite a small sum of money, the right to now call it the Dalmia Red Fort uh, for however many it is, three years, to put up corporate hoardings. And the best case scenario that I've read about this is that all they're allowed to do is to uh, put up their logos in return for a commitment to build toilets, uh, a, a nice visitor center, um, and, to, uh, and, and, to, and to pay for tourist facilities, a reception area, ticketing, that sort of thing. Mm. Mm. But there are all sorts of things in very... I mean, the, 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 there's been a, a lack of clarity exactly what kind of supervision the ASI will have over these people and, what, and how far they will be allowed to do their own initiatives. So in the initial report in the Business Standard, it was reported that there was a clause in the contract that stopped the Dalmia Group, or whichever corporate it was, that went for adoption. And, and they went straight out with the biggest monuments in the country, Konarak, the Taj Mahal, the Red Fort, you know, the really big. It wasn't like Dalmia being given a Haveli in the old city to kind of you know, experiment with and do a test run. They went straight off, and they get Taj Mahal, Red Fort, Konarak Sun Temple. And um, in the first report in the Business Standard, it was claimed that there is a clause in the contract that will prevent Dalmia being, being able to be sued by anyone if they do damage, for example, and given, if they lease out the Red Fort for a rock concert and some of the lighting gaffes or sound systems um, start ripping up the marble. Uh, according to the report in the Business Standard, um, they will not be able to be sued for that. So, so if they decide to have a corporate jolly and invite ACDC to come and play in the Red Fort or whatever it is, uh, uh, and there is damage to the monument, there's nothing anyone can do about that. So, I mean, it seems to me that on one hand, you have this brilliant thing where you can give to some, an organization like the Aga Khan the right to do state-of-the-art conservation, which everyone thinks cannot, cannot possibly disagree with is a good thing. On the other hand, you have the leasing out to a corporate with no record of conservation. In fact, in the case of Dalmia Group, uh, a, a record of, of actual destruction of Mughal monuments by members of the family. Um, and um, that they will... So, so it, I mean, it all depends on the fine print. What are they going to be allowed to do? Uh, how much supervision will the ASI actually genuinely have 
Uh, and will Ababu in the ASI, in reality, actually be able to stop Adalmia, who's a leading donor to the, to the VHP, the RSS, the BJP? Is anyone actually going to listen to the, uh, the civil servant in his office behind the National Museum when uh, old man Dalmia turns up and says he wants a, a new lighting rack or a huge hoarding? Or, I mean, how far is it actually going to work? So it's, it, while potentially getting corporate sponsorship for monuments can be a very good thing, if it doesn't actually have proper professional supervision and a genuine ability by the ASI to stop horrors taking place, we could see some really dodgy stuff going on. Thank you. I'm just going to check on the time. <laughs> um, I see that we've got still quite a bit of time left. <laughs> um, one of the things, Will, that... This is kind of backtracking quite a bit um, and moving away a bit from the ASI, but you've been photographing quite a bit of, you've had a lot of travel photography and you've had a couple shows recently. Um, do you document Indian sites and are you influenced any by the early photographers? Just out of curiosity. So um, I'm, I, my new show and my new book is called The Historian's Eye and it is entirely pictures of, of monuments associated with my new project on Shah Alam okay. and the company. Okay. So it's very specifically that period between 1737, th Nadir Shah, and 1803, okay. um, Lord, Lord Lake. So yes, I have. Okay. My great, great aunt is Julie Margaret Cameron, who was one of the first oh. photographers in the South Asia. And she brought her camera from, from uh, London to, uh, to Sri Lanka. Um, and some, uh, I think some of the very first pictures of Sri Lanka were taken by her, but not in India, although she was born and brought up mm -hmm. in Calcutta. And was half Bengali. Yeah. Do, you ha do you have any questions for either John or, because I see you're scrupulously taking notes like you normally do. That, that, <laughs> <laughs> that was just my thoughts on the Dalmias, yeah? Okay. Um, <laughs> We'd love to hear that. <laughs> Would you be happy if we open up to sure. some questions? Please go for it. Um, I had a question about, uh, you've spoken about the destruction of these monuments in a sort of uh, people who are in power. But the question I had is about this peculiar habit in India of uh, visitors scraping a heart and like putting their initials on. Um, and I've heard arguments by people that it keeps the monument alive um, <laughs> and sort of gives people access to something that's, you know, makes Lovely, it there. Bubbly loves Rinku. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I just wanted to know what your opinions are on that. <laughs> Can I actually have John answer this? Because I know we've got some early photographs actually documenting graffiti. Um, well, a, it's, a it's, yeah, it's it's not a it's it's not a new phenomenon. I mean, there are photographs of Elephantra in the 1870s where tourists have carved their name. And in fact, if you look at um, the great sculptures at um, in Egypt, a lot of them have um, and. Lot, Persepolis is riddled with... Um, John Malcolm has got his name out there. <laughs> almost everybody has. Even Stanley, the African explorer, has carved his name at Persepolis. Of course, these have now become um, objects in their... Uh, they've become part of the history of the monument, but I don't think it's... Rinky and bubbly, necessarily. To be, to be recommended to... If, if that's the only way we can keep these monuments alive, then we're in deep trouble. Um, about the continuing um, decay of monuments in the care of, of the SI, um, the screen of, of the scales of justice in the Red Fort has been being continually damaged and is much, I mean, just in the short period that I've been going, uh, it's, it's more and more of it is missing. But even in the south, uh, the Rangin Mahal at, at, at Bidar, which has some of the most beautiful inlaid um, calligraphy in Mother of Pearl in the dark green stone, uh, the guards themselves are sort of just picking that out. Um, so what can we do about that, you know, when, when things are actually uh, full of guards, um, ticketed entry, uh, whatever, and yet the damage is just ongoing? I think that's quite a difficult answer for the four of us sitting here on stage to do, because we don't have any direct 
we're not able to directly influence the ASI from sitting here. Um, I don't know if we'll... I think, I think one of the problems is there is a, a very different attitude to history in, in South Asia. And the, the British are obsessed with history, because in a sense, it's all they've got left. Um, you know, we've got, you know, everything, so every, every Sunday night, we settle, settle down and watch a Jane Austen and look at some bonnets and <laughs> popping past, and, and you know, hunky chaps in breeches striding out of pools. Um, and, uh, and there just isn't that tradition, in a sense. I remember one friend telling me, you must realize that we Hindus burn our dead. And there is a sense of profound difference. And for, and for many people in India, the, the past, the distant past is glorious. But the last 1,500 years is, in the eyes of many people, uh, you know, a period of humiliation, uh, a period of, of, of coloniz uh, successive colonizations. Mm. And many people do not look at it with pride. And I think that's changing. And, look, and since I've lived in Delhi in the last 30 years, you now have a whole plethora of groups doing walks around the old city, Ghalib's Haveli, which used to be a coal store, has been privately restored now with a few plaques up and some nice Urdu poetry on the wall. Uh, Mir Takimir's grave, which was lost under a urinal in Lucknow, has now been restored. Um, there are little moves aside to uh, I mean, private, uh, the, the work of the Aga Khan in a hundred different places, and Golconda and so on. Um, and looking at the internet, there's all these wonderful groups of Delhi walks, Lucknow walks, Hyderabad heritage walks. Um, but it's a beginning, and, 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 there's a be and, and until people begin to be interested themselves and to love these monuments themselves, and for them to fight for the archaeological survey to have enough funds to get on with its own restoration. And, you know, India is not a poor country anymore. India is, is a country with a space program. Mm -hmm. um, if there's enough money for a space program, and if, you know, the political parties claim to be uh, the, you know, the nationalistic heartbeat of the country that they, they claim to be, there should be money out there to, res to keep this past restored and looked after. Ditto the museums. Um, BNG is... BNG, could you... Can I embarrass you and just ask you to talk about the, for example, the state of many of the manuscript collections, the way you can't get into the... You yourself, as the greatest scholar, have had to fight to get into certain institutions in Rajasthan. The state of things, for example, in B Hindu Banaras University, uh, a similar a similar problem. I'm sure I can make the point a bit better standing up. Uh, standing up not to the ASI, but <laughs> standing up ask, answering a question. You know, the situation in Indian museums and libraries, as far as manuscripts are concerned, is pitiable, is truly pitiable. I'll give you an example. There is a group of paintings in the body called the Puratattva Parishad or something like this in Jodhpur. Rajasthan Oriental Research Institute. Yeah. yeah. The, and I was told by somebody that a painter that I was interested in, Manku by name, that 105 paintings by the same man in one particular series in absolutely, you know, in impeccably kept condition are in that collection. I landed up there. You have the accession number? I was asked. I said, I don't have the accession number. Uh, then we can't produce anything. I said, I've heard that there are 105 paintings out here. But luckily, I mean, I had seen those paintings about 20 years earlier than that, and I remembered the accession number. 1527, I said, ah, yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, and we have that. And then they pulled out sort of a great big, um, you know, bundle in old khadi, absolutely tightly packed. And they took it out. And I said, may I photograph a few things? No, 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 you have to go to the government of India to get permission to photograph. I said, I already have photographs of these because I did that 20 years ago. I want better photographs. No, you know, this is the situation. Yeah. Luckily, they were all well preserved because nobody looks at them. The basement is full, absolutely packed to capacity with bundles of paintings which nobody has seen for years, and yet they are inaccessible. 
No, it, things are really mouldering away, and that's a great pity. And nobody, nobody really truly cares. Two cases that I know that you've been concerned about in the past. Could you talk a little about what's happened to the Salajung collection and mm -hmm. to the uh, BHU, the Benares Hindu University collection? Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> what does Mirza Ghalib say? Rakhiyo Ghalib, mujhe is talq nawai se muaf. Aaj kuch dard mere dil mein sawa hota hai. Forgive me for being bitter and uh, feeling bitter at this time. Because the pain I feel at this moment is a little more than I used to feel. <laughs> right? Like that. I'll give you an example, not of Salar Jung, not of the, of the BHU, but restoration, which is being done, so-called restoration, by the, you know, ASI wing. I was in Chamba. You know, Vijay Virat is a great sort of group of temples going back to the 10th, 11th century. And I was reasonably well-dressed. So one pandit, the priest, he thought I must be a government servant. So he walked up to me. And he said, sir, have you ever seen swans turn into crows? I said, I've heard about that, read about it, but I haven't actually seen them. Come, I'll show you. And he took me a little frieze, which had got damaged, a beautiful swans, I mean, you know, carved in stone and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Some of them had got destroyed, and the ASI had stepped in to repair that. And slowly you could see swans turning into crows, mm -hmm. right over there. Now this is the state of affairs. What we can do about it, I don't really know. The two cases which um, we, I referred to, the Salajang Museum has had the same pictures on display. Exactly. Uh, riveted to the walls for yep. 30 years. And um, illustrations which are, um, are printed in um, uh, Richard Eaton's book, Sufis of the Deccan, um, these lovely, uh, um, uh, what, what are they called, that technique, with, with the, that Deccani technique of watermarking. Yeah, 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 really. yeah. Uh, Marbling. Um, yeah. Totally faded and oxidized beyond repair. Yeah. BHU, you showed yesterday um, as, as the centerpiece of your, of your uh, display yeah. of uh, Manak's work, yeah. uh, the cosmic egg. Yeah. Um, the mount of that is covered with biro scribbles. It is, it is. Um, that someone has scribbled, and, it, and presumably it could have had, could easily... It, touched the actual... I mean, you can't... Find and the picture's been riveted again to the walls for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Nothing has moved. Nothing really has moved. Mm. And more and more inaccessible things are and so on. So what can you do? I mean, George would know, I mean, uh, <laughs> how things are. I mean, we're all lamenting this and so on. But and yet one feels completely powerless, completely powerless in this situation. The BHU, which is one of the greatest collection of paintings in the whole of India, is in inaccessible. Why? Even to you? Yeah. The Kala Bhavan in Banaras is inaccessible. A few things on the walls, the rest of them are in a vault, mm -hmm. and you have to really, you know, run the gauntlet of half a dozen people to be able to get into it, and then you have to be armed with accession numbers before they open anything up. Now, I, at my age, hoary old age, um, and with some kind of a reputation of having written a few things and so on, I'm not completely unknown as an art historian, <laughs> right? And yet, I have my share of major problems, major problems getting into any of these. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'd like to ask George Michel about um, Hampi. I first went there over 50 years ago when it wasn't, it wasn't on any tourist map at all. There were absolutely no facilities. Went there again a couple of years ago, three years ago, and it is now a major tourist area and uh, with huge facilities. I'd like to ask how much of that is to the credit of the Archaeological Survey of India. And to what extent, are you use the word historical imagination in, in your title. Uh, imagining history is a very post-colonial thing and everyone does it, of course. But um, I, that, that uh, book whose author I forget, but it's called Imagining India, almost the only period and place which he, the author mm. regarded as truly Indian was about a period of about 50 years 
when the Vijayanagara Empire was at its height, and there were links across to Orissa as well. So my question really is, to what extent is the ASI, has it involved itself in arbitrating questions of historical imagination and the kind of priorities that they might give to excavation? Well, the ASI doesn't have a culture of discourse. They don't set up, should we do this, should we do that, what is the best, what is the latest? They have a well-entrenched culture of what they do. And uh, one of the things that they do is that they try to deny history. It, the, the thing that drives John Fritz and myself to distraction is that the archaeologists want to give a clear picture. They don't like the idea that everything should be in ruins. Now, of course, us Europeans, <laughs> We've got a whole culture of, you know, pleasure of ruins, and this hasn't quite integrated itself into the, I would say, historical imagination of um, bureaucratic India. I wouldn't say individuals in India love to go around ruined sites and enjoy them, and Hampi, of course, is incomparable as a ruined medieval city, naturally. And the ASI have been guarding the monuments, but once upon a time we could run around freely and look at everything. Now there's barbed wire, and of course, the dreaded horticultural branch of the ASI, <laughs> an unstoppable force bringing water um, into areas which have deposits beneath the ground and therefore damaging what can't be seen. Though I have to say, lawns are quite welcome in a dusty environment. So the ASI have done quite a lot of welcome interventions other interventions we do not appreciate. And I don't want to get up and say, you know, they've done bad work or good work, but there's never been a situation in which people, archaeologists would sit with historians, would sit with other scholars and say, well, you know, we have these options. What would be the best thing we should do? What are our priorities? What is the demands of tourism? What should they be provided with? What should they not be provided with? And if any of you have been to Hampi recently, there's nowhere there's no bathroom, there's no water, there's nothing anymore in Humpy Village. They have dismantled the whole tourist facility which benefited local population, not understanding that having the local people having a stake in the heritage of Humpy is a tremendous Asset. Some, something to be, um, I would say, um, developed. Nor had anybody taken any trouble with local people saying, why don't you do this instead of that, and therefore we could preserve your 16th century mandapa with an internet facility in the middle of it. So I would say it, it, opportunities have been lost on how the site could be best developed. And if anybody who's been in the last years gone to the mango tree restaurant and having wonderful refreshments, anybody here? Gone. <laughs> gone. You can only regret can I, you've partially answered uh, my question, but history is a very recent and very small part of human development in, in India, let alone everywhere else. So patriarchy being a rather important part of India's way of life, um, that's a very small part of human development. Uh, what is recorded about prehistory in India? You want to talk no. about prehistory? No, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. 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 We have some experts. Well, I think that the archaeology efforts to do with prehistoric sites is very often more professional, I wouldn't say always, than to do with medieval sites. There, I think, is greater prestige to earlier phases of Indian history or prehistory. And there are some very good schools of archaeology in India, like the one in Pune, that have been doing, I would say, quite professional work, and Carla Sinopoli is here, who's been working on a prehistoric site uh, near to Hampi. So I would say that um, prehistory is, I think, done a little bit better medieval. than medieval archaeology. Anthropology? And anthropology probably too, if at the earlier phases, because India is very comfortable with its, with its imagined earliest phases. It wants to, you know, wants to emphasize this very early phase. Hampi is one of these uncomfortable, destroyed cities in a particular historical circumstance, and there's a lot of baggage there that is, is difficult to penetrate of, of, I would say, a black and white historical imagination. And some of our research 
and many of us have been working on nuancing this into shades of grey, that it's not such a simple story. Arti? For George, really, um, I'm at University College London and our Institute of Archaeology, ha, we do, there are people who do excavations, Neolithic and prehistoric, um, but some people say it's quite hard to work there, and I wondered what, um, how attitudes have changed to international collaboration if, if, if it extends and increases the scope of what's possible for the ASI. Have you seen changes in attitudes to, to that over, over the years? I think it's quite, still quite a struggle, but it has been possible for certain groups from America, from here also, to get involved. But India does not have the culture of even Pakistan, Bangladesh, Southeast Asia, Nepal, which have had a long history of foreign teams working. And if any of you have been, like we have, to Turkey and Greece, there's a whole history of foreign teams working and collaborating. Maybe Indian ASI people think they have the biggest archaeological survey service in the world. They don't need foreigners to come in, and which I think is um, a great shame because I think there's a great deal to be learned from, uh, from both sides. It's still very difficult, I think. Or, well, I don't know, do you have a team from University College excavating in India, you see? Okay, there you go. Cheddar Man looks as if he came from Andhra Pradesh anyway, doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I hardly dare ask this, having just come from a session with Sashi Tarua. <laughs> but um, did the British overall have a positive effect on the preservation of uh, historic buildings? in India, I mean, other than the famous ones like the Taj Mahal? Yeah, I think by and large, there, there are a number of rather disgraceful episodes. You know, the buildings inside the... Um, Red Fort. The Red Fort, um, uh, and buildings were whitewashed to entertain the Prince of Wales when he visited in 1875. Those are isolated... Incident. Lord Bentick trying to sell off the Taj Mahal for uh, yes. melting down. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there are, you know, there, there are. It was certainly always difficult for that little group of dedicated scholars and antiquarians and archaeologists to really persuade the Indian authorities that this was a useful way of spending money and a necessary way of spending money. I mean, the, I, mean the, I mean the British Indian authorities, pre-independence, pre both, both in India and at home. With some um, notable exceptions. For example, Warren Hastings as the patron of the Royal Asiatic Society, Curzon and, and, and for all his faults, later, making the of conservation. Much, exactly, the much denigrated Lord Curzon, the arch-imperialist, uh, was devoted to Indian archaeology and architecture and was a very great expert on it. Um, and he, he lobbied remorselessly for um, preservation of Indian architecture. So I think on the whole, yes, I think there was, there was certainly, you know, the, the survey has been dedicated to that, how successfully they've, you know. But we shouldn't be too smug. I don't like to see people from this country making negative remarks about um, what's happening in India. Just up the road, there was a very fine neoclassical station <laughs> it was pulled down in the 1960s by the planners. Mm. So we shouldn't feel that in this country we have an unblemished record of respect for history and historical monuments. The whole of George and Glasgow. Well, I mean, you know, Covent Garden was only, you know, preserved by a slump, so they didn't pull down the market. So, you know, you have to realise that um, India is not different, I think. This is the, the point. We shouldn't consider what's happening in India and the problems in India are not essentially different to other countries. Maybe they're at a different stage of awareness or wealth. Or yeah. When did we get interested in our historical heritage? You know, So it's something for us to understand better what happened in our own cultures and lands before and we make... And the difference in, in attitudes in this country between the 1960s and 70s, when yes. there's a free-for-all knocking down country houses... Unbelievable. And so on. More yeah. than yeah. the Germans bombed, I believe. Yeah. I think we've got time for one more question. I think it's true. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. So I want to come back to the ASI and sort of tie together themes that have come up in the last 
are, and ask the three of you to evaluate the ASI in terms of state-of-the-art you know, architectural and archaeological preservation today. Where are India's strengths and where are our weaknesses? We, you know, any insights you have into the training of our whole archaeological society of India staff? Where are we lacking? What needs to be focused on? And even in terms of the way the ASI is organized against, you know, some of the sort of benchmark uh, surveys in other countries. Well, um, this cannot be uh, responded to in 20 seconds, but one, one sort of construct that I've developed is something I called Old India and New India. And there is in the ASI elements of the New India, talent, energy, um, innovation. And if the machinery of the ASI was just a little bit more flexible, some of that New India, yep. some of these younger in age and in openness and who've traveled and have the opportunity. I, I don't feel totally negative about the ASI. I think that there would be a chance if these new India elements could eventually prevail and the old bureaucratic blockages could be overcome, I think things would improve enormously because they do a fantastic job, if you think, of how many places there are in India that come under the ASI. Great. There are some things that are very good, some things that are, that are not. I mean, the, the simple stretch of resources is the, is the most obvious problem in that the, there are millions of monuments out there. Half of them have no guard. Uh, you know, just a little blue plaque with, a, with a, a notice of the 19, whatever it is, archaeological act, and it's in the fence to destroy it. But hundreds of monuments all over the country have no guardian. Um, those that do often have one, and then, so, you know, if he's guarding the gate, what's going on at the top of the hill, you know, that sort of thing. Um, pockets of real talent. There's a character working at Ajanta called uh, Engineer Singh, who's done these extraordinary... Um, uh, he's uncovered the soot-blackened uh, murals in Cave 10, which are the earliest, other than Bibbedka, are the earliest paintings of, of Indian art. But the ASI being the ASI, having done this extraordinary work, didn't tell anyone um, and didn't publish it. And so these, last time I went to Ajanta, I saw all these faces, um, which had never been in any of the books, and never been, never been photographed, never, I mean, never been published. And these were from the, the main period of Ajanta is, is about 650 AD. These were about 100 BC, 700 years before the main body of painting. Uh, and beautifully restored, beautifully painted, and um, nothing had been published on them, um, which was great. I mean, it was a fun project to go and do, but you know, it shouldn't, shouldn't have been me as a casual tourist. Um, <laughs> and and uh, so you have some real talent, as you say, some younger archaeologists, incredibly good, incredibly keen. Um, there's other cases of shockingly bad conservation, of shoving concrete over the roofs of, of, um, of Delhi tombs, uh, incredibly crude uh, attempts at, uh, at paint, repainting murals with felt tip pin, pens. I'm literally not, I'm not being uh, uh, joking. Um, and so it's very varied. Very varied scene. But overall, there's no question, massively underfunded. Uh, and for, a, and, you know, this government claims to be patriotic, nationalistic. If only it could express it by just doubling the funds of the ASI, which wouldn't, you know, actually put it back a huge amount. Um, and, and to spend it on conservation. Okay. India is not a poor country. So at the, we're at the time is up. <laughs> And I just wanted to thank everyone for coming to hear us speak on the Archaeological Survey of India. But as Will says, without money, nothing can happen, basically. <laughs> and hopefully in the future, we will see more of these buildings preserved and maintained for